25 in your study guide, and let's see if we can't jump in here and get started. Page 25, just for review, then we'll get into what we have for tonight. 1 Peter chapter 2 and page 25. Again, those of you who are watching by uh, YouTube, we want to thank you for participating and uh, that you're up and ready and alert. Praise the Lord <clears throat> that you have your Bible and your study guide. And if you don't have a study guide, you can always purchase one from the bookstore here at the Wynn. And uh, that way you can follow more closely with the rest of us. So thank you again for your participation. And you can always invite your family, friends. If you can convince a couple of enemies to come, amen, get them too. Praise the Lord. This is good for everybody, okay? Praise the Lord. All right, you should be there by now. Uh, looking at verse 7, <clears throat> again, it says, Therefore, to you who believe, and there is a comma behind the word believe. Is that correct? Do you have a comma behind the word believe in your Bible? Verse 7. Okay. This is how you read this. It's almost, you can say it in the form of a question. <clears throat> Who is he precious to? Hello? I can't hear you. All right. He is precious to those who believe. It's not a run-on sentence where it says, to you who believe he is precious. No, no, no. He is precious to you who believe. So to you who believe, pause, he is precious. The question is, is he precious to you? How precious is he to you? Right? So if you are a believer, he is precious, should be precious to you. All right? Meaning that he's the most important person in your life is Christ. All right? Amen. In terms of our salvation, in terms of our relationship with God and all of that, that does not mean we neglect our family, but it does mean that Christ should have preeminence somewhere in our lives. OK, no question about that. All right. So to you who believe, pause, he is precious. All right. It's making a statement. Got that. All right. And uh, and so, again, is he precious to everybody? Huh? Okay, only to those who believe, right? Only to those who believe. Because it says right there, but, right? Okay, so, so let's look at the but right here. But to those, which means there's another group, right? And so what is he to those who are disobedient? Huh? Okay, he's not precious. Very good. He is not precious to those who don't believe. Now, uh, you will hear people out in the world, your workplace, your neighbors, wherever you frequent, you will hear people say, we all are God's children. All of us are God's children. That is not true. All of us are God's creation, but all of us are not God's children. Hello? Yeah, so, so when they say that, it's okay to correct them. They may not like it, but you have to correct them because you can't let that lie continue on because it's not true. OK. All right. Jesus made a distinction between those who follow him, believe him, trust him and those who don't. He made the distinction. OK. Not us. So so you're on good ground if you if you bring a gracious correction to them. Amen. So. All right. So again, he is to those who are disobedient. And again, the word disobedient, you can put right alongside that word disbelieve, disbelieve. OK. All right. So 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 what what is actually being said here now? This this is a tough one. Uh, for me to disbelieve is equivalent to being disobedient. Ooh. Ooh. -hoo. Isn't that something? And so you, you, you don't just commit a sin because you go out and do something really obvious that it's a sin. Most, most believers wouldn't think about this. For me not to trust God's word is equivalent to me being disobedient to God. That's pretty serious. That's a challenge to all of us who struggle with faith, with believing God in the midst of adverse circumstances. What better time to believe God than when we're in the middle of crazy circumstances? 
Hello? Especially if we have a promise that God has made. Regarding our circumstance, I got this promise. So instead of these crazy circumstances, I got his word. So I'm going to hang on to that. Right? Okay. So, so this disobedience is equivalent to disbelieving. Disbelieving is equivalent to disobedience. All right? And then it goes on to say um, um, that they, that they uh, let me see here before. I don't want to run ahead of myself here. Um, okay. All right. <clears throat> okay, so we got to the part where it talked about the stone which the builders rejected. Again, who are the builders? Okay, <laughs> the, the, the spiritual leaders of Israel were the builders. Okay, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, which was the, the Congress group type thing, and, uh, and the scribes, all, all of the people who were committed to studying the word of God, the scriptures, which means the Old Testament. They, their whole lives were spent on studying and researching the Old Testament scriptures, their whole life, all right? And, uh, and so they were the builders of Israel, the builders in Israel. But, it, but again, it says that they, the ones who were most spiritual, the ones who were most aware of what the scriptures taught about Messiah and about this, this rock, this stone of stumbling, this chief cornerstone, they knew all about that all throughout Isaiah. Just, uh, and many of the prophets talked about this, okay? But they, it says here that they rejected him. Is that correct? They, they scrutinized him. They had people follow him all over the city, wherever he preached and ministered and healed and cast out demons. They saw all of that. They saw all of the evidence that was necessary, and yet they still did what? Rejected him. Okay? Um, now, now, again, I asked you the question before, who has the final say, who has the final say so over Christ's life? God does, right? Okay? And so who has the final say so over your life? God does, okay? Now, if he was rejected, notice what it says, they rejected the, him, right? But then he, the one that was rejected, has become something. The one who was rejected has become something. And I just want to make a quick personal application to us today. Even if we're rejected by the people we love and trust the most, that's not the end of all things. We, we shouldn't give one person that kind of power over our lives, right? Even if we're rejected, the possibility and the potential to become something is still there. Hello? Right? If Jesus was rejected and he became, listen, the chief cornerstone, right? The main stone in the building, period. And so the same possibility is true for you and I today. If we are rejected, not if, when. <laughs> when. When we are rejected, we have to understand and know that God has the final say so, and so we keep pushing, right? We keep pushing because God has destined for us to become something, something a little more than what we think we are, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, okay? He's purposed for us to become something more than we think we are. And so don't let rejection stop you. It stops a lot of folks right in their tracks. And the more you honor somebody and the more you're rejected by that person, the more you're stifled. But God has a becoming process waiting for you if you'll keep moving. Hello? Is anybody here? All right now. All right. I'm just checking it. Elvis left the building. Okay. Praise the Lord. Here we go. So, so the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief, the main, the priority stone in this building. In other words, you can't build this building that God is working on without this stone. Can't do it. And yet Christ became that. All right. So he didn't let the rejection interfere with his purpose for being here on the planet. Amen, amen, amen. All right. So we did look at, again, uh, verse 8. So it, uh, uh, to those who were disobedient, uh, 
uh, this chief cornerstone became a what in verse 8? <clears throat> a stone of stumbling. In other words, they walking down the road, they saw this big rock, they, they, they bumped into it, they tripped over it, and got cut by it on the way down. They saw the stone, but they bumped into it anyhow, tripped over it, and was cut by the same stone. That's what stone of stumbling means. Okay? All right. So they knew Christ. They knew who he was. They heard what he taught, and yet they chose to reject him. And so he became for them a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Again, the rock of offense is like a trap that you're walking down the road, and all of a sudden this, this uh uh, a rock, a wedge rises up out of the ground and you see it and you trip over it anyhow. Okay, so it's like a trap. It's, it, it means a, a trap set to trip somebody up. So, so this is saying that these, these religious leaders in Israel, they would not be persuaded. Not that they couldn't be dissu- uh, persuaded. They, they didn't want to be persuaded. It's just like you and I, we're out witnessing, we're talking to people, and they absolutely don't want to hear what we have to say. They don't want to hear it, period. Get out of my face. I don't want to hear it. Has that ever happened to anybody? Okay, all right. Okay, so, so again, they would not be persuaded in spite of all of the evidence. And when you and I are out there witnessing and we present the evidence of who Christ is and people still make up their mind that they don't want him, you, you, you can't let your feelings get hurt. You just go on about your business, right? You planted some seed, and you pray for that seed that somebody else will come along and water that seed. And there's a rule pretty much that you can operate by, and that is you pray for that seed until the Holy Spirit tells you to stop. Okay? The reason why I say that is how long did it take for you when the, after the first person witnessed to you about Christ? How long did it take? Did you accept Christ right there on the spot? The first person that witnessed to you, did you accept Christ on the spot? So it took you a little bit of time, right, for that seed to be sown and watered. And then at some point in all of our lives, we said yes. We said yes. So so that's why I'm saying pray for the seed until the Holy Spirit says stop. Everybody got that? Okay, very good. Okay, now... um, Right here in your your study guide, we talked about two groups that you can place all of the people in the world in, uh, in verse 7. What are they? Okay, you have a microphone? Uh, uh, Turn the microphone on. Oh, that's okay. It was a good answer, but everybody need to hear it. I'm saying those that believe and those that are disobedient or non-believers. Okay, that's so one. What's the other group? It's two groups. Yeah, the, the, the non-believers. It's two groups. Uh, okay. Okay, the, believe, the ones who believe and, and, and don't believe. Yeah. And then what's the other group? In verse 7, it's right there. Oh, those that are disobedient or don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say I'm sorry. Let me look closer. Okay. Does anybody anybody want to take a shot? Okay. Uh, I see hands going up halfway. Okay. What? Right here in the center table. He is precious with those who. Those which the builders rejected. Therefore, he is to believe, and he is precious with those who. Um. Uh, I'll say half of that statement is part of the other group. It's ain't. Okay, you said, uh, or the builders. Say, say, say that again, right here. No, no, say it. Say it, say it, say it out loud. <laughs> Are you saying the builders? No, 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 no. Get, pass her the microphone. Okay. Yeah, I'm just going off of what I Put the microphone in front of your mouth. So I wrote here, you and those... Stop right there. That's it. Don't say nothing else. That's the answer. <laughs> okay. That, that's it. All right. Look, look at verse 7. 
It says, therefore, to you. Okay, that's one group. And it says, but those. So that's one group. You and those is a group. And then the other group is those who believe and those who are disobedient or disbelieve. Two groups. That's why I said groups. <laughs> which is right. The question is right there in your book. Which two groups can all people be placed? In verse 7. Two groups. You and those. those and then believers and disobedient or, or disbelievers. Okay. Everybody got that? Okay, now you forever know, right? Okay. <laughs> all right. So, so what will always be true in every setting, anywhere there's a group of people, anywhere there's a group of people, and this is even in churches, you will find some who believe and some who don't. In every setting, every setting that Jesus taught and preached and ministered in, some believed and some didn't. It's just true of human nature, okay? Even in the church, you have people sit right in the church and go through the whole service and walk out as if they didn't hear anything, and their lives don't change. They continue to be the same, all right, until all hell breaks loose. Lord, have mercy. Help us, Lord. Okay, all right, moving on to verse 8. Notice it says that they stumbled. How did they stumble? How did they stumble in verse 8? Okay, by being disobedient, the next question is to what? I'm, right, thank you for putting all that together for me. <laughs> okay, they stumbled. How did they stumble? By being disobedient. It's right there in the, in the scriptures, right? By being disobedient. Disobedient to what? The word. The word. Ah, they were disobedient to the word. So they disbelieved, didn't believe the word of God, the word that they knew inside and out. These are not novice. These are not people who just, you know, just got a hold of the Old Testament scriptures. These folks have been studying this stuff for years and years and years. Okay. Yes. It says here, they stumbled. Wait, 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 wait. It says right here in the verse. Look at the verse. Look at the verse. Verse, verse 8. They stumbled. And the question is how? Oh, okay. It's right there. <laughs> that's okay. Yep. See, that, that's my goal is to get us focused in on this word so we can see what we didn't see before. It's, it is right here. Trust me. Okay. So by being disobedient. That's how they stumbled. So, so again, it's, it's, it's using this stumbling as a metaphor to describe their disobedience. Okay? All right. And they stumbled being disobedient to the word. Everybody got that? It's right there in the verse. Now, look, look next. It says, to which they also were appointed. So my question is, appointed to what? What were they appointed to? Somebody say what? Okay, the word. Why did you say that? Okay. All right. She's actually right. Um, again, if you stay right here, they were appointed to the word. Okay. Now, I want to I wanna give you another word to put right alongside the word appointed. Okay. Write this in. They were assigned the word. They were assigned the word. Now, last, last time uh, I, I brought up a couple of uh, one little question, basically, um, that made us think because People who believe in predestination will come to a verse like this and say, see, it says right here, they were appointed to stumbling. They were appointed to disobedience as if God made them stumble and made them be disobedient. But, but that's not it at all. 
okay? That's why you have to look carefully at the verse here. Again, their stumbling and disobedience was to the word to which they were appointed. They were appointed the word or assigned the word. These are, these are Jews, and uh, I want to give you a couple of scriptures we're going to look at real quick, and then we'll come right back. So, so turn to, turn to um, Romans chapter 2, verse 17. Romans chapter 2, verse 17, and also Romans 9, verse 4. Romans 9, 4. So Romans 2, 17, and Romans 9, 4. Everybody turn there real quick. Two, let's start with 2, 17. Okay. <clears throat> All right, and it reads... <clears throat> Now, now, the book of Romans, Paul is doing a masterful job because he's a Jew. He understands the culture. He understands the idioms. He understands, you know, the nuances. He understands everything about what it means to be a Jew. So he's arguing, <clears throat> um, or excuse me, presenting a defense uh, on behalf of what he has come to understand about, about who Messiah is. And, and they were braggadocious about a whole bunch of stuff, okay? They thought that they were saved and was going to be okay just because of some of these reasons that we're going to look at right now, okay? So verse 17 says, Paul says, Indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law. In other words, your whole life is based upon the law. That is the word of God. So let's just substitute the word law for the word of God, the Old Testament scriptures, Okay. All right, so, so you rest, uh, and there's a number two right there with rest. Uh, let's see in verse 17, and um, in other words, you rely completely on the word of God. Okay, did you see what I just did? Yes. Okay, I took the number two, went to the center column, found verse 17, found a little bit in number two. All right, so you guys are catching on. Very good. All right, so they relied on the word of God and made their boast in God. And know his will. Who knew his will better than the Jews? Who knew his word better than the Jews? Because they had been assigned. The God gave his word to the Jews. Actually to the Hebrews at the time. That's who he gave his word to. And approved of the things that are excellent. What's more excellent than the word of God? Right? They approved it. So, so that means that they studied it. They researched it. They were aware of it fully. And it says being instructed. They got all of their instructions out of the word. What, if, what, if, what, 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 what would the church be like today if we got all of our instructions from the word? If we, if we start finding out what we're supposed to do from the word and start living that out. Oh, my God. All right. And it says, here, and you're confident that you yourselves are a guide to the blind. How can you guide somebody when you don't know the truth? Right? Both, both folks going to fall into a ditch. Right? That's what the word says. A light to those uh, who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. They had all of this stuff going for them. They were assigned this stuff. God chose them to be his chosen people, not because they were good, but because they were Abraham's offspring. That was it. it. Their goodness had nothing to do with God's goodness toward them. Okay? Same way it is with you and I. We can't earn our way to get anything good from God. It's his goodness. It's his righteousness. It's his holiness that we get because we placed our faith in Jesus Christ. That's how we get the goods. Okay? So, so there are people in the church who think if I work hard enough, if I strain, if I push, you understand, if I'm driven to do this stuff and chase after, and then I'll get it. No, that's all flesh. Our trust absolutely is in what Jesus completed for us. Now we read the word, find out what God expects of us. Now we live that out. Not trying to get saved, but be it becomes the fruit of our salvation, the proof that we are saved. That's what it is. Okay? That's a whole big difference right there. So, so these Jews were boasting in all of this stuff because they had been given the word of God. They were responsible for it. Okay? Uh, um, uh, 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 trust me, I'm not bragging. I'm just stating a fact. When, uh, when, when, we were, uh, when I was in Bible college, um, the year, be uh, year before I graduated, I think it was, they, they passed around 
uh, pe uh, not petitions, uh, applications to submit a name for the graduating class. And, um, and the name that I submitted was the name that they, they adopted. And the name of the, of the class was Guardians of the Truth because we are responsible to guard this truth. The Jews were responsible to guard the truth. They were stewards over the truth of God, the word of God. They were it. People should have been able to come from all over the world to come to them to get understanding about what does the scripture say. How many people can come to you to find out what the scriptures say? So you can see yourself how far you and I have to continue to go to get prepared so that we are ready to give anybody who asks us a reason of the hope that lies within us with meekness and gentleness. We don't argue with people. We present our case. We leave the rest of it up to the Holy Spirit, period. Okay, everybody got that? All right, turn to chapter 9, Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, verse 4. <clears throat> and here Paul again is um, contending with the mindset of the Jewish people. He says, again, here they're bragging. Let me read verse 3. It says, for I, I, for I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. In other words, Paul is saying, if, if I could offer my life for the salvation of my people, I would do it. Do you feel how deeply he feels this message of the gospel and how, how desperately he wants people to be saved? That, that's a lesson that we all can pick up on. Are, are we desperate for people to be saved? You understand? Do we really feel this stuff deeply? I don't know. You have to ask each person individually. And you can tell by those who go out and witness and those who don't. Okay? So, so again, that's something personal for each and every one of us. All right? So it says here, you who are Israelites, to whom pertains the, look at all these favors they had. They were the ones who had been adopted by God. They experienced the glory um, uh, of God, the covenants of God. Notice there's an S on the end of covenants. We think Old Testament, New Testament is all there is. No, there's a bunch of covenants in the Old Testament, a bunch of them. All right. And so, again, that's a that's a, uh, you know, a, a worthy study. If you decide to, to look at that, uh, it's a very, very worthy study. So. So, again, you, the co you, you had privilege to the covenants. Amen. You, you were given the law, the, the service of God. Uh, th that's the worship part of the, the, the Levitical uh, practices and what have you sacrifice and all that stuff, feast days and all that. And and, and, and the promises you, you had all of that. Paul says you had all of that. You had everything you needed to recognize that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And you rejected him. So, so go back to 1 Peter. Go back to 1 Peter. So, so again, when it says, they stumbled being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. And so to what were they appointed? The word of God. They were assigned the word of God to keep it, to guard it, to be the steward over it, to make sure that it got out to the whole world. All right. OK, so so that that's what the appointment was to in, 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 my, in my humble opinion. I'm just one person. All right. Amen. All right. OK, very, very good. Now, uh, moving on, verse, uh, page 26 right there, verse number 9, it says, What are the first words indicating a contrast between verse 8 and verse 9? First words. First words of verse 9. <laughs> what are the... <laughs> okay, you, do you see the question right there on, on page 26 of your study guide? Verse 9, it says, what are the first words? Everybody see that? 
What are the first words indicating a contrast between verse 8 and 9? But you. But you. All right. Is a contrast from those. Those who were disbelieving. But you. And there should be a difference between us and everybody else in the world. We're not the same. They, 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 you know, some of you maybe, if they, I don't know if they still do it, but they used to have these bumper stickers where they had like seven, five, six, seven different religious groups on there. And they said, we, we all believe in the same God. That's not true. That is not true. Okay. I'm just saying it because it's not true. Okay. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> um, God makes a distinction between us and them. You and I should be glad about that, that he doesn't lump all of us in the same basket. Yeah. All right. So 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 t tell somebody at your table, I, I, I'm glad that you're not one of those. Just one of those. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Not one of those. Just say, tell yourself, I'm not one of those. Yeah. Th those who disbelieve, those who are disobedient. Amen. Those who stumble. Those who don't guard and protect the word of God. I'm not one of those. So we, it says here, but you, amen. I, I like that, all right? Then moving on, the next statement on your, uh, page 26 is, there are some specific callings. Somebody say specific callings and expectations of every believer. There are some specific callings and expectations of every single believer. Let's see what they are. Verse 9. What's the first one? You are a chosen generation. <clears throat> you, you, that's you. Okay. Now all of this stuff that we get ready to talk about. Belongs to you. And one of the reasons why pastors have to work so hard and have to do so much is because we have not accepted our assignments. Hello. You are. Somebody say, I am. That's right. I am a chosen generation. Let's look at the word chosen. If you have a spirit-filled life Bible, I've been trying to tell y'all to get that a long time ago. But anyway, most of you should have it. Let's look down here at the word wealth in the shaded area where the word chosen is listed. Okay, everybody there? All right. Okay. <clears throat> Eklektos is the word in Greek. From two different words, ek means out of, and lego means what? To pick, to gather, all right? The word designates one picked out from among the larger group. So, so, so t look, t t t tell, tell your next door neighbor, tell her I've been handpicked. Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Listen, from among the larger group for special service or privilege. God has handpicked me for special service or special privileges. I would say and special privileges. It's not or, it's both. I, why don't you say that? I have been handpicked for special service and privilege. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm not making this up. This is what it means. This is who you and I are. And until we see ourselves in light of this, we will just be a church member. We'll come here and we'll jump up and down a little bit, you know what I mean? And, and then after service is over, we, we go home and not much changes. And so chosen here is that God has handpicked us out from among the rest of the crowd. It's just like when you go to the grocery store, you go to the vegetable section, amen, the fruit section. They got all kind of stuff over there, right? And you walk, you work your way through, touch about 15 different pieces. Now your handprint is all over the stuff that somebody else going to buy. And 15 other people did the same thing before you picked the piece you got. Lord, have mercy. All right. But you chose out of all of the tomatoes, uh, tomatoes, out of all of the fruits and vegetables and all that, you handpicked the one that you selected. Right. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, we do this all day long. Whenever you go shopping, you go in the store, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the store, but you specifically go in there to pick something specific for you. Is that right? Yeah. So, so hand pick, all right? And then it goes on to say it describes Christ as the chosen Messiah uh, of God. It describes angels as messengers from God and believers as recipients of God's favor. So this word chosen is a really important word here, all right? And so this is the verb tense. Now, when it talks about Christ, the, the chief cornerstone is mentioned as a noun. So the chosen one. But here it goes back to the verb tense, which means, again, this is the act of God choosing you and me. Do you know how many people there are in the world? <sighs> Somewhere between six, seven billion people. And God looked down there and picked you. Lord, have mercy. <laughs> see, see, this is the stuff that helps us to understand how special we are to God. But we don't see ourselves that way. It's hard for us to see ourselves as this special to God. And he's trying to tell us how special we are. And we'll see it at the end of this too. Okay, all right. Okay, so, so chosen generation, all right? This generation uh, refers to a, a, a race or a body of people, write it down, with a common life purpose. It refers to a race or a body of people, a race or a body of people with a common with a common life purpose. So you and I are, um, are a chosen generation, a body of believers with a common life purpose. The reason why we are so disconnected and disjointed in churches, and this is every church, the kind of unity that should exist in every church does not. Let me just tell you, it does not. There's some semblance of, of unity in every church, but it's not like God wants it to be. Okay? And it's because we don't understand that there is a common life purpose that all of us should be committed to. Not your agenda, not my agenda. It's God's agenda. What does he want done? What is the purpose of the church? If I ask you that question, I'm not going to ask you to answer it, but if I ask you that question, what is the purpose of the church? What would you tell me? Yeah, but it's more than that. See, it's more than that. It's more than that. It, yeah, it's, it's that and more than that. Okay, so, so I'm just saying the, the purpose of the church, the purpose of the church is really important. If we don't know what that is from God's perspective, then we get caught up doing what we do which is not bad, it's not wrong, but is it the thing, the it that God is after for the church? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. So, so anyway. Um, <clears throat> all right, I ain't going to say that. All right, okay. <clears throat> so we are a chosen generation. Is it based upon, well, let me ask you, what is it based upon? This being chosen, what is it based upon? Is it predestination or is it faith? Faith. Huh? You say it's both? Okay. I'm not even going to answer that question. I'm going to let y'all chew on that and, and get mad at me because I didn't give you the answer. Usually when you make a statement or you give an answer, you have some scripture reference in mind. Okay? Uh, you know you can't just make a statement and not be able to back it up in these classes. Right? Okay, if you go back to chapter 1 and kind of look through there and, and maybe even the first part of chapter 2, you might make some discoveries. Okay, but I'm not going to give you the specific answer. All right, so is it predestination or is it faith that we're chosen? Mm-hmm. Ah, 
We, we kind of hinted about this very thing in chapter one. All right, but memories are short. I understand. <laughs> Y'all got to go to work every day and give Caesar what belonged to him. And whoo, don't have much left over after that. All right, so, so we're not going to waste. It, is it in verse two, Pastor? Bless, is it in verse two? Verse two where? Uh, let me. Are you in chapter two, verse two? Chapter oh, one, verse two. Oh, chapter one, verse two. Okay, what does it say? It says, uh, uh, no, verse 3. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Okay, I think that's a very good answer. Yes, ma'am. Uh, microphone, 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 microphone. I know. <laughs> that's a good start. <laughs> There is chapter 1, verse 5. Chapter 1, verse 5. What does that say? Who are kept by the power of God through the faith for salvation. Okay, that's another good one as well. All right. In other words, when you make a statement, you got to be able to back it up with something. And usually you can find the answer right in the same book or even chapter that you're looking for the answer. You don't have to go to another book in the Bible to find the answer. The answers are here. Okay? All right. So uh, you got another? Is something else in verse 2? Okay. Yeah, right. Okay, so the elect, we talked about that, right? Those are the ones that were selected or chosen. Same, same word, okay? All right, by the foreknowledge of God. Um, <clears throat> okay, we're not going to go back and dig into that, but that's a good verse, a good point. Okay, very good. All right, so you understand my point. If you make a statement, you've got to have something to back it up with, okay? Now, I don't want to scare you away from making a statement or giving an answer, but, but just know that, you, if, if, if somebody asks you this out in the street somewhere, you, you got to have an answer or else we, we, you know, we're going to lose credibility and we don't want to do that. All right. Very good. OK, so we're a chosen generation, a body of believers. Amen. Listen, with a common life purpose. So what do you think indicates to some degree what the purpose of the church is here at the wind. Huh? No, no, it's not in this verse, no. This is just in the wind, the church here. What's, what's the closest indicator to a common purpose? Huh? The mission statement. The mission statement. Anybody know what the mission statement is? Love, honor, serve. Okay, love who? Love God. Love what? I'm going to tell Pastor Singletary on all y'all. Now, he said it, but that's no. not the whole thing. Pastor, it's honor God, love God's people. And serve our generation. Okay, now okay. that's it. That's it. All right. All right. No, okay. don't tell, don't tell on us. Sarah, okay, don't, don't tell, tell on, on us. us. Okay, I won't tell on us. <laughs> See, if you can't remember that, then how do you know that what you're doing is this common life purpose? We should all be moving in the same direction. But if you don't know that, then you're going to do what seems right to you. And it may bump into somebody else who's trying to go the right direction, right? So, so, so those, the mission statement, the vision statement, th those things are important. They guide the ship. They, they indicate which direction the ship is going in, right? So, so it is important that you try to get that down in your heart so you can spit it out any time. Th there was a movie... Um, Lean on me, years ago, uh, school, high school principal, rough school and all that kind of stuff. And the, the new principal made it mandatory for everybody to learn the school song. 
And he said, if I stop you in the hallway or the bathroom, you better be able to sing that song. <laughs> and he hemmed up them four brothers in the bathroom, right? And he said, sing me the song. And they start fumbling, and all of a sudden, they had perfect harmony. Lord, have mercy. Beautiful, beautiful. They was ready. They was ready. Crooks, but they was ready. Thugs, but they was ready. Lord, have mercy. <laughs> All right, very good. So, so you should be ready at any point that somebody asks you, especially those of you who are serving in some kind of leadership capacity uh, or, or place of influence, you, you should be able to say exactly what it is. Boom, boom, boom. All right, that's what adds credibility to this church. That will inspire other people to learn this stuff too so that everybody is on the same page. What's the next thing here, the next specific calling and expectation? What is it? Royal priesthood. Royal is, again, could be better translated, a king. Oh, my God. You and I are, are kings. Literally, king priest. It says royal priesthood. So kingly priesthood. Now, under the Levitical order in the Old Testament, you could either be a king or a priest. You couldn't be both. But under this new order, under Christ, you and I are both. We are king priest. Say that out loud. I am a king priest. Now, what do kings do? Lord, have mercy, Jesus. I can't hear you. Say it out loud. They rule. They govern. What else? Is that all? <laughs> they sit on the throne. Okay, they sit on the throne. Okay, they don't just sit on the throne. They do. What else do they do? <laughs> what else do they do? <laughs> they make decisions. They establish policy. Okay, what else do they do? Okay, they enforce the policies. All right, what else? They discipline and punish when folks just don't follow the policy. Oh, my goodness. What else? See, that's the part we don't like. <laughs> Pardon me? Okay, they give rewards for obedience. Very good, very good. All right, they take care of their constituency. What else do they do? Y'all missing some very important stuff? Well, yes. Okay. What else? I can't hear you. <laughs> See, don't be, I mean, don't be afraid to just throw it out there. Okay. Let, let me help you. Uh, kings go to war and conquer. And they bring back the spoils to bless their kingdom. They also defend their kingdom against any possible threat. Mm. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's what kings do. So, so what are you defending? Amen. What's the threat against what God is calling you to do and to be? What's the threat? And what are you doing to defend that threat? What, what are you conquering? Because kings go out to conquer. Get the mic. Get the mic. Get the mic. This, this is not boasting, but no, no. Uh, the Lord, when 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 um, this country was going liberal way over its and uh, sanctioned marriage and all that, and the gay rights and all that, I wrote the song. It's my right. Okay. I, and I sang it here. You gave me permission to sing it here. No, no, right? not now, not now. Yeah. So that's okay. no, no, you, no. So you gave me. Oh, permission I gave you permission. Okay, yeah. Here, right? Yes. And and it's not attacking anyone. It's just stating that God is love. He loved the sinner, but not the sin. That's basically the song. Okay. Right? Reese, she she did um she did background for me. Okay. That song, but yes. So that's 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 why we we fight. Yes. We fight in love. We fight. <laughs> In, in whatever gifts that God has equipped us with, we, we don't just sit back. We, okay. we use our talent to, to, to get out there and make, make a difference however we can. That's exactly um, right. Yeah, so. 
we as Christians, for the most part, are more passive than we are aggressive. We're, we're very passive people. What we'll do, instead of going out there fighting, we'll, we'll pray. We'll, we'll pray. But we don't pray with the same intensity and aggression as if we were out there in the fight. We really want God to do everything. <clears throat> and um, and um, it's a known fact that around uh, um, election time, a lot of Christians don't vote. And then we wonder why our country is in the shape that it's in. Uh, I, I don't know if y'all remember me, but I tried to, 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 to warn some people, don't vote for that person and don't vote for that person. Praise the Lord. I said, if you vote for them, either one of them, fasten your seatbelt. I said that from there. Fasten your seatbelt because I already knew it was going to get crazy. And where are we right now? In the middle of crazy. I knew it. But nobody listened, and they voted for whoever they voted for. I don't know who people voted for. I don't want to know. But I'm telling you, you have to consider who it is that you're voting for. And one of the persons running for a particular office, um, <clears throat> in the voter's manual that they mail out to everybody, they have a write-up. They have the picture and the write-up of the person, right, and a little bit of information about who they are and, and uh, all of that, their position and so forth. Uh, but this particular person just had his picture. He had no write-up. And he got elected. Because people say, oh, he's handsome. <laughs> no write-up. He didn't even bother telling people what his stance was. And people voted for him. That's why your gas is almost $7 a gallon right now. That's why he just voted that, that <clears throat> any school <clears throat> that does not teach this, this crazy curriculum to little bitty kids <clears throat> will be fined. And parents who stand up in opposition will be considered um, terrorist. I don't know where you get your information from, but this is true. This is true, from, from the White House down to the governorship here in California. There's some crazy stuff going on, but we Christians are so busy looking at everything else, we got a head in the sand, and then we don't speak up. My, my, my wife, with her little old bitty self, went to Sacramento two times. I went there two times to protest some of the stuff that they was doing. Two times. We don't write letters. We don't make phone calls to the people who make decisions. And so we wind up with what we wind up with. And that's where we are right now. It, we, we're in very serious times right now. Very, very serious times. But kings go out to war. They fight they win battles, and they bring back the spoils. That's what we should be doing, okay? And then this priesthood, <clears throat> um, what, what do priests do? What do priests do? Can't hear you. What do priests do? We are king priests. What do priests do? We found out what the king does. What does the priest do? Offer sacrifices. What else? Pray, okay. <laughs> Pray and fast, okay. No, priests don't go to war. Oh, they share the word, okay. They minister to people, okay. To see so, so, so how are you going to, uh, yeah, hold that point. I want you to say that, but hold it one second. I want you to say it, but hold it one second. Um, how are you going to really assist the pastoral leadership of this church if you don't know 
what they're supposed to be doing. Got quiet in here. <laughs> How are you going to assist if you don't even know what it is that he's supposed to be doing? It shouldn't be a secret. Hello, y'all with me? Y'all still here? Yeah. Shouldn't be a secret. All right. So, so, um, so we want to find out what the priest are responsible for. From God's point of view, he's the one who appoints the priest, right? And so what, what does he want of the priest? Okay, now make your point. Uh, in, in the example of Moses, uh, um, um, you, see, you see Moses had a direct connection with God all through his time in ministry. Okay, what did he do? He interceded. He communicated with God. He okay, go, what, what's that word you just said? He interceded. Okay, that's what I want. Yeah, inter- that's what yeah. I want. He interceded. Okay, this is, this is intercessory prayer. And if you go back and read that example about Moses, he was seriously interceding for the people because that's what priests do. They represent God to the people, and then they represent the people to God. They're the go-between person. And it's not just praying, but it's intercession. It's spiritual warfare praying. That's another level of praying that most Christians don't get to because it's work. And if it takes more than five or ten minutes, I'm through. That's why Peter told the folks in the book of Acts chapter 6, it says, listen, uh, you guys take care of feeding the homeless and feeding the, 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 the people among the church and so forth that were needy. He says, because we have to give ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. That's what we have to do. And if we are spending our time feeding this and doing this and taking care of all of the menial jobs that other people can take care of, it's going to interfere with me studying the word and praying so that when I get up before you, I have a word from God to give you that changes your life. And so how are we going to help the pastoral leadership team if we don't know what they're supposed to be doing? Okay, so, so, so priests represent God to the people. How are people going to know about God? That's the priest's responsibility. Who's going to intercede for the people? The priest. Take those needs, petitions to God on behalf of the people. He's the go-between. That's why one of these days, prayerfully, that people will begin to give like they could and should so some of these folks can come off their jobs and spend full time in the church. Um, The husband is the head of the house. And um, when that understanding is there, then yes. That kind of interaction is what happens. Right. Um, <clears throat> okay. <laughs> you almost tempted me to say something else, but I ain't going to say it. <laughs> okay. So again, you and I, you and I are these king priests. So this is what we should be doing, not just the pastor. We should be doing this. I am this king priest, and I do what kings do, and I do what priests do. That's each and every one of us. That's the call. That's the expectation. What's the next thing on the list? A holy nation. Holy, again, a people separated to serve God. A people separated to serve God. A people separated to serve God, holy. And then it says holy nation, right? And so this word nation here means a multitude of people, a multitude of people having the same nature. A multitude of people having the same nature. A multitude of people having the same 
nature. Oh, my God. Now, turn quickly to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. 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 Get there, say amen. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. All right, and it reads. <clears throat> now, let me back up to verse 3. As his divine power has given to us all. To who? Us all. All of us. Given to us things that pertain to life and godliness. All things, rather. He's given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. How? How? Through the knowledge of him who did what? Called us by glory and virtue. So, 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 so here it is. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of God. So the more we grow in the knowledge of God, amen, the more we can participate in all of these things that God has given to us. Okay, now verse four. By which... Um, have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. Exceedingly great and precious promises that through these, underline that, through these, you and I may be partakers, that is to take part of or share in the divine nature. You remember I said that this, this, this holy nation is a multitude of people having the same nature. And so each one of us as believers share in the divine nature. Now that uh, shows up in, in varying degrees based upon how much you know about the promises of God and to what degree you are participating in those promises. Does that make sense to anybody? Did I lose anybody on that one? To whatever degree you know the promises and are practicing the promises, that's the degree to which the divine nature is at work in you. Now, God's nature is in us. His nature is in us. But it will only work according to how you work it. If you are practicing these promises, these exceedingly great and precious promises then you will, to that degree, participate, take part of the divine nature that is in you. Isn't that something? So you and I have a common nature. We're just not a common people. We're common people committed to the same purpose, but we also have a common nature. The divine nature of God is in each one of us. And, and, and we sit back in these chairs and pews and we wait for the people on the stage to do all of the work, most of it. Now, I have the nature of God in me, and yet I'm just acting like a church member. If I don't get exposed to this kind of stuff, I'll never think about how this stuff applies to my life. I'm way more than a church member. Hello? That's the bottom. That's the front door. You haven't even got in the house as a church member. Compared to what God says is the specific callings and expectations for all of us. You and I. That's you. That's you, 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 and me. This is where we should be operating. And so we do need to be taught. What if you weren't here tonight? You wouldn't know this. I'm sure you've read this verse. <laughs> but it didn't mean nothing. <laughs> this is you and me. This is what God expects of us. And until I see myself at this level, I'll just be a church member. 
I'll do a little bit here and a little bit there around the church, and I'll feel pretty good about what I'm doing. A couple of people will smile and pat me on the back. It's wonderful. But that is so far beneath who we're supposed to be. Okay. Turn back to 1 Peter. Oh, my. What's the last thing here on this list? His own special people. Get ready to write. Get ready to write. Ah. This, this, this special people carries the idea that God is making something or made something. God made something. God made something and then surrounded it. He made something, he surrounded it with a circle. With a circle. I hope y'all are writing this down. Indicating ownership. He made something, then he surrounded it with a circle, indicating ownership. I'm not finished. We are the unique, write that down, we are the unique private personal ownership by God. The unique private personal ownership by God. When he says we are his special, his own special people, this is what it means, what you just got through writing down. So I am unique, his unique, private, personal possession. See, 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 you need to tell somebody at your table two things. Number one, you didn't know you were sitting next to royalty, right? You the king. I'm the king. Yeah, I'm the king. And the second thing you need to know about me is, say that, the second thing you need to know about me is how special I am to God. Woo! My, my, my. See, when we begin to see ourselves in light of how God sees us, things will change in our lives. As long as we keep seeing ourselves through our own lens, we're going to limit what God can do in our lives. No way around it. You, you remember when, when uh, the Israelites sent out spies uh, to, to spy out the land and they came back and the 12 spies, 10 spies said, we can't do it. We are like grasshoppers in their sight. And in our sight, we're like grasshoppers. There's no way we can take that land. Thank God for the two, the minority, the minority of the 12, the two folks, Joshua and Caleb said, listen, they like bread to us. We could chew them up and spit them out. Why? Because God said, go take the land. So they was believing what God said and that God would be with them. That's where their confidence and boldness and strength would come from. Them other dudes was thinking about what they're going to do in their own strength. That's why you can't always follow the majority. Hello. And so how do you see yourself? Do you see your, see, and I know it's, it's tough sometimes to try to get through what I know about me that nobody else knows about me. And God knows about me. He knows that dude. You understand? And yet he tells me how special I am to him. I have to fight through that stuff to get to that so that I can become, begin to live in light of what he says I am. You got to press through. Or nothing will change of our lives. We'll just get comfortable somewhere and we'll just stay right there. 
We'll stay on, on the other side of, of the Jordan River instead of going in and taking the land or accomplishing whatever it is that God wants you to accomplish in the ministry or service that you have been called to. What's, what's, the, what's the ultimate of what you would love to see happen in your ministry or in the area that you're called to serve in? What, what's the ultimate? Wasn't the title of the message? What, remember, I remember the title of the message was what? Think big. Think big. What, what's the ultimate of what you would like to see happen with what you do? If I begin to see myself the way God sees me, these are the callings and expectations of every single believer. But if these things are not taught, they're not preached about, they don't nobody talk about them, then, then we don't know. Just like I said, y'all read this verse before. It didn't strike fire in you because you didn't really understand the personal application of it. This is who we are. This is what God expects of us. Does everybody see this? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's the first, the first two words of, of verse 9? It's what? But who? But you. Tell somebody. He's talking to you. Tell somebody. He's talking to you. He's talking to you. He's talking to, yeah, he's talking to us. Yeah. And so, so what, what if, what if, listen, what if within the first one to three years of your Christian experience, you got a hold of this kind of stuff? You would be dangerous right about now. Dangerous. And that's what made the disciples so effective because they was with Jesus. They got this stuff firsthand. They saw it in action. It became a part of who they were. It was their calling. It was the expectation that Christ had for them. And they went everywhere. And they did what Jesus did. Hello. This is amazing stuff. Okay. So, so, so you and I, again, are challenged to whether or not we're going to really grab hold of this some of us need to go home tonight or tomorrow or sometime and go over this again. Lord, I, I, you know, I, look, help me with this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> help me with this. Okay, yes, sir. Pastor, I, I, I went to Corinthians 5.17 again, and, like, what you're sharing, and, and it's, like, crazy. For me. It's, like, it's too much. Yeah. You know, um, I'm just going to read it again. Okay. It says, um, therefore, if anyone is in Christ. Yes, sir. He's a new creation. Uh-huh. All things. My, my, my. Have passed away. Behold, mm. all things. Yes. Have become new. Yes. And it's, all of this yeah. is new. All of this is new. All of this is new. But this is you and this is me. This is us. I say this. Because I say this right now, you know, I was abused as a child and I live a lot of my life in fear. Wow. And not trusting people, even though I serve in the wow. church. Wow, wow. But tonight, these two verses, mm, 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 mm. they impact my heart so deep. Wow. That's why you see me like this. Amen, amen. I just want to thank you. God bless you. you. You're welcome. This is, this is what teaching is supposed to do. This is what preaching is supposed to do. Teaching and preaching. This is what it's supposed to do. Okay? We got to see ourselves in light of how God sees us. Or nothing's going to change. All right? Turn to Psalms 8 and we'll close with this. Turn to Psalms 8. Psalms 8. Psalms 8.
Let's go with verse 4. Start at verse 4, Psalms 8, verse 4. <clears throat> and it reads, What is man that you are mindful of him? If we had time to go into what these different words mean, it would just, again, blow your mind, okay? That you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him. For you have made him a little lower than the angels, <clears throat> and you have done what? Crowned him. With what? This word crowned literally means surrounded. It ties right into what we just got through saying about special people. God made us. He encircled us <clears throat> as proof that he owns us. And here it says that he crowned us. This is not that little Burger King crown you stick on your head. This literally means to encircle us, to surround us with glory and honor. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, I wish we had time to just look at this Psalms 8. It is an amazing Psalms. What's your question? Man. Man is just beneath or lower than the angels. As far as um, uh, creative order. Okay. And, but look, what did God do with man going all the way back to Genesis chapter 1? He gave him dominion. Right? He gave him rulership over everything that he made on this earth. Getting us ready for how to rule in the last days or in the kingdom days when Christ comes back. We will be given assignments of rulership. And so God's intentions from the beginning was to start the training process with Adam and Eve. But they messed up. But the same thing would have been true if you and I was in that garden. We'd have messed up too. Okay. Yeah. So, so again, this is referring to mankind. <clears throat> God's purpose. I'm telling you, Genesis chapter one, verse 28. If you ever want to know what God's purpose and vision for your life was and is Genesis chapter one, verse 28. He said, be. And then he goes on to say all those other things. And the fact that he said, be fruitful, be blessed, be multiplying, and all that other stuff means that we have the capacity to be that, to do those things. We have the capacity inside of us. But if we're not taught this kind of stuff, we don't know it. Again, we keep seeing ourselves as grasshoppers, caterpillars, crawling around on the ground. Instead of eagles flying high, butterflies, you understand? Just it's how we see ourselves is the issue. That's the issue, okay? So again, when it says here, he crowned us with glory and honor, literally means he surrounded us with glory and honor, literally with his presence. This is, this is again, proving ownership and his commitment to you and me. And so I pray that you and I get a hold of some of this, that we really pray about this, and that we ask the Holy Spirit to help us with this kind of stuff, because this is where we should be living. This is what we should be doing. It should not be all on the pastoral leadership team of this church or any church. All right. We'll pick up on verse... Uh, the rest of verse 9 next week. <clears throat> I, don't even, I don't even know how to stop, to tell you the truth. 
but this stuff needs to sink in, and I'm praying that it's happening right now inside of you. And it's actually breaking in on some of our old thinking. Brother Crawford just read, old stuff is gone. New stuff is now. Mm. My, my, my. Father, we thank you tonight for our time in your word. Not only were the Jews appointed to your word, we too are appointed to your word, to be guardians, to be stewards, to be those, oh God, who give this word out wherever we go, every opportunity that we have. You have called us to be kings and priests. You've chosen us. <laughs> We're a holy nation. We're your very own special people, Lord. God, we admit that we need help in really digesting this stuff. This is, this is above our, our, our human understanding, oh God. And yet it is true all day long. It's what you want of each one of us. It's what you've always intended for those who follow you, those who believe in you, those who've accepted uh, your son, Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior. It's what you've always wanted. But we have been ignorant, Lord. We've not known, oh God. We've not been diligent in our own study and research of the word. We've not seen the personal application of what you're trying to get us to see and to know and to understand but Holy Spirit, this is your opportunity that we give you now to begin to open our eyes that we may see what we have not seen before so that we can do what we have not done before. And God, according to the message on Sunday, we want to think big. We want to think bigger than what we have thought, oh God. We want to imagine that this is true of each and every one of us. And that we will be responsible to encourage others to see themselves in light of this. And to do all that we can to get others to come to the Bible study so that people will see this all together. It will make for a much stronger church when we all hear the same thing, Lord. But I do thank you for the remnant of these who are faithful every Thursday night. Lord, continue to bless them. And if those are still watching at home, Lord, we pray that they too will get a hold of this and be challenged to be more, to be more, oh God, than a church member. Father, we thank you for our time together. We thank you that we've sat at your feet and we've learned from you tonight. Stamp these truths upon the tables of our hearts so that we don't soon forget. Help us to become all that you intended. Bless us now as we leave this place, never from your presence. Bring us back together again at the appointed time. We promise to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name, and everybody in agreement, said amen. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. All right, all right. The offering basket is available, and if I can get you all to fold up some of the tape, fold up the tables, and um, uh, 